Well, we're going to start a brand new series today. It's going to be awesome. It's going to change your life. It's called The Power of Rest. I think you need that right now. <laughs> it's not about taking a nap or a vacation. It's much more powerful than that. We'll talk about it here in just a minute. But let me talk about the year coming up. Uh, this year coming up, 2018, is a very special year. On the Jewish calendar, it's the year of the open door. Now, Drenda is my personal prophet. <laughs> there were years ago, I got mad at God. I said, why do you always tell Drenda things and not me? He said, I did tell you. I said, when? I told her. <clears throat> now, my wife, she, she spends every morning in prayer, and she just hears from God, and sometimes she'll say, hey, this is what the Lord said. Then I'll pray about it, and I felt the Lord confirm that the year of the open door is, is, is this year. And there are some things stirring in the heavenlies. And this is a year of reaping and harvest. It's going to be amazing. I suspect I sent a letter out to our partners this, this week, I think. It said, whatever you had set your sights to do in 2018, double it, and you will not be there yet. It's going to be that kind of year. So you have to go into it with your mindset right. You don't want to miss this. And it's going to be by the Spirit. It's not going to be by your grip my teeth and let's get it done thing. It's going to be by the Spirit. And you can walk in tune with the Spirit to catch the timing, the location, the method, everything you need this year. All right. So January, we're going to dive into the series. My job, I'm your coach. All right. Yeah. All right. You waited too long. You, just, you waited too long. Push-ups, every one of you right now. <laughs> uh, we've got to get you ready, though. We've got we to gotta work on that mindset. We've got to aim into the year here. So let's get ready to do that. Hey, by the way, Christmas Eve, Christmas weekend was awesome. We had over like 36, over 3,600 people participating in church. <clears throat> we had 72 people give their hearts to Christ last weekend. I was so proud of that. I love to see people make that kind of a decision because I know what it's going to do for their life. And it's so awesome to see that. Now, today, many of you that are regulars, this is going to be a review, a lot of review here, not all, but a lot. But when you're taking a test, review is good. And this year is going to be a test. And you got to pass the test. So we're going to spend some time setting the posture. We have a lot of new people that have come in. But we're going to set the posture and kind of review some things. So a lot of you know our situation. Many of you may not know our situation, but Drinda and I lived nine years hand-to-mouth financially, basically living in financial turmoil. Financial turmoil is another name for a very slow death. I'm not kidding. You cannot have peace in this life without finances, period. You can go to heaven, but you can't have life, peace life, uh, you know, peaceful life here without finances. That's why we call it, you got to fix the money thing. But we lived that way for nine years, you know, borrowing from anybody and everyone, pawn shops, judgments and liens, everything canceled, everything broken, panic attacks, antidepressants, you know, just a horrible way to live, you know, buying a happy meal and dividing it three ways for kids. I mean, just digging in cushions for quarters to go find another meal. I mean, it's just it's a horrible way to live. You don't have life living like that because you don't dream about anything except just making it one more day. You know, having your nose to the grindstone, where are you looking at? People that are living overwhelmed never can receive new direction because they don't, they're not tuned in right. They, wouldn't even, they couldn't even receive a new direction for 2018 because they're already overwhelmed. I can't do anything else. I'm already maxed out. Now, if you're saying that today, you better unmax yourself. <laughs> and you got to change your processes. Change is required, but you can go past that. What I'm trying to say is that you've got to be able to hear the Spirit, and you've got to be able to react to it, and you can't have your nose to the grindstone. You weren't designed to live that way anyway. Your job, by the way, your spiritual occupation is not provision, by the way. Your number one job in life is not just to survive, just to, to buy the food you eat. Jesus said in Matthew 6, life is more than food and more than clothes. You have a purpose in life that supersedes paying your bills. Did you know that? Okay, making it plain here today. <clears throat> so you know our story. Nine years, long time. And then got to the place where we just... There was nothing left. No one would give us any. I mean, we were done. In fact, uh, my mother called Drenda, and Drenda was talking to her, and she said, uh, how are things going? You know, Drenda broke down in tears. She said, well, what's going on? You know, well, 
She said, go to your refrigerator, open it, and tell me what you see in it. Drenda went to the refrigerator, and there's a jar of empty mayonnaise in there. That was it. And so we've been there and done that, got the T-shirt, didn't want the T-shirt, don't want you to have the T-shirt, all right? So attorneys, bill collectors lined up, you know, they're waiting to talk, you know, and so a lot of you heard the story, but essentially I was done. I had to hear God now. I mean, I had to hear God now. I ha- you ever been there? I, I've got to hear God. I got, I've got to have some, and I've got to hear God. So I uh, went to praying, and the first thing God said to me, the mess you're in is not my fault. You ever heard people say, I don't know why God's not, you ever heard someone say that? Well, stop that. It's never his fault. Never. He said, the reason you're in this mess is because you've never learned how my kingdom operates. You'll go out and buy things on debt and want me to pay for it. That's not how my kingdom operates. You got to learn how my kingdom operates. We didn't know how it operated. Had no clue how it operated. So anyway, we began to learn about the kingdom. Now, kingdom, it's important. Again, this is a basic kingdom is the king's dominion. A mob is not a kingdom. Kingdom infers government that ensures that every citizen enjoys the benefit of the king's dominion or his authority flows through that government to every single citizen. King's dominion. So you got to learn you're in a new kingdom. It works different. In Luke chapter 5, we find a story where Jesus is walking along the lake there and he's gathering some disciples around him. In verse number four, he borrowed Peter's boat, went out and preached from it. When he had finished speaking, it says, he said to Simon, who is Peter, put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I'll let down the nets. Now this, this is super important. You gotta start saying because you said so instead of rehearsing the past. Now he just rehearsed the past. We fished all night. Are you insinuating that we do not know how to fish? You're a rabbi. I mean, come on now. We're professional. I don't know what your excuses, your past, where you come from. It doesn't matter. Just say because you say so. You got that? You just got to say because God said so to move forward. You cannot move forward saying why you're not moving forward. Well, they fished all night and caught. What do you mean? Put, go over there at deep water. We fished all night and haven't caught anything. Stop that. Just say, because you said so, okay? Just do what God says and move forward. When they had done so, they caught such a a large number of fish, and they said, we'll put down the nets, that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sing. Now, here is a picture of two kingdoms. One is in your own strength, all night, nothing, and the kingdom of God, two boats sinking full of fish. You choose what you want, two methods, two systems. And so Peter saw this, fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. For he and his companions were, what? Astonished. Aren't you tired of the, of the religion? Come on, you can be honest today. Aren't you tired of religion? There's nothing astonishing about it except wins it over. Friend, you should be living an astonishing life. I mean, if you're not astonished at it, who wants to see it? (laughs) Uh, This is going over well. (laughs) They were all astonished. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. You got to leave the past to find the future. You got to leave the past to find the future. You've got to leave the past. Someone needs to hear this. You've got to leave the past to find the future. And you've got to follow the kingdom direction for your life and let go of the security you think you have catching no fish where your confidence is in yourself. And you've got to put your confidence in the kingdom. You've got to start learning some new stuff. Amen. So when Drinda and I heard God say, you've got to learn how the kingdom operates, I'm like you. What does that mean? I have no idea. I'm going to have, I have, what do you mean the kingdom, how it operates, you know? Well, it caught my attention because kingdom infers laws. I could learn laws, but no one ever told me there were laws. 
I was taught to beg and fast for 25 days and cry out and weep. And the, the more I wept, I thought God heard my prayers. The more upset I was crying and carrying on, I thought God, you know, he hears my prayers that way. Do you know, <laughs> with your legal position in the kingdom, you don't have to feel anything. You have the authority. You don't have to pray a 20-minute prayer. Come out in the name of Jesus. It's about how long it takes. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, anyway, so God said, let me, he, he wanted to teach me how the kingdom operates. So let me help you with your deer hunting. Now, I've been hunting and not getting a deer. I don't like failure. So number one today, if you are experiencing failure, that's an indicator you've got to change. There's something you must change. Don't learn to accept failure. Don't agree with it. Start changing. Say, okay, Lord, show me what to do. I know this isn't your best. I know this isn't where I'm supposed to be. Obviously, I got to change. I don't know how to change. You show me, right? The Bible says the Holy Spirit is your counselor. Use him. Let him speak to you. I don't mean use him in a negative connotation, but he wants you to ask him for help. All right, so help me with my deer. He said, take a check, write in the memo section for my 1987 buck, my deer, sew it into a ministry that I tell you to and call it finished according to Mark 11:24. Mark 11:24 says, therefore, when you pray, believe that you receive and you shall have it. When you pray, when you pray, not when it shows up, this is a revelation. When you pray, therefore, when you pray, believe that you received it when you pray and it will show up. Instead of saying, where is it? Where is it? I don't see it. Stop saying that and say what God says. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. If God says it, trust me, he can get it done. Okay? So I sowed that, and uh, again, this story most of you have heard, but I want to bring it into the picture here. We lived in Oklahoma, and a guy asked us to come out and hunt at a farm there in Tahlequah Thanksgiving morning. Never been there. If you're a deer hunter, you want to scope things out. You want to make sure everything's to your advantage because deer don't volunteer to be killed. They try to avoid people. And if you're going to hunt deer, you have to learn their methods, where they run, you know, kind of learn where they're at, where they're feeding at. You, know, you, gotta, you have to kind of become what they think like to get one because they don't volunteer for dinner. Just kidding. Anyway, so I went out there and he says, well, I don't, there's this, there's this tree, go, and this, go sit next to that big tree in that field over there. It's dark, you go out in the dark, I go out there in the dark, it gets light, and I find I'm sitting next to a tree, one tree in a harvested hay field. Now, if you are a deer hunter or any kind of, you, the deer can see you in the middle of the field, right? No self-respecting deer is going to come moseying up to you in the middle of the field, when they see you in plain daylight, right? So I'm sitting there, but I have a supernatural weapon. Like Peter, James, and John did. I'm sitting thinking, I don't know. This doesn't look so good. But it's not based on only the circumstances. God's involved with this. And so this buck comes running behind me. I'm, I'm, like I'm here, the tree's here, and this buck is running through the field right for the tree. And I'm behind the tree. He can't see me. Until he gets to the tree, he smells me, and he puts the brakes on, and he snorts. He goes, whoa, what is this? He looks over at me, and I'm sitting right there. I look up at him. We're five yards apart. I say, hello. <laughs> he takes off, and I, I had the privilege. I dropped that deer. I took it home for dinner. We had venison, finally, after all these years. But it's a 130-yard shot. You ever seen whitetail run when they're scared? They bounce. They move out. Sitting offhand, 30 out six, scoped out rifle. It's hard to get the crosshairs on a deer. It's running full speed, sitting down offhand. One shot, the deer's down. I was like, astonished. I knew that wasn't me. So the next year, I went out and did it again. Now it's been 30 years. I go out every year and get my deer 30, 40 minutes. I don't have time to tell you all the stories, but so many amazing stories. I could even uh, had the deer pinned down to the type, size. I mean, I began to experiment with the kingdom. I found that it works very specifically. Now, I'll give you an update, for instance. I do this every year. On November 7th, now, I, I sow my seed for meat. I'm a meat hunter. 
I always say, give me a four-point or bigger and a button buck. You get two, I, I take two. So I sowed my seed this year for a four-point, four-point. Just in case someone doesn't hunt deer, they, what's a four-point? Four points. <laughs> and a button buck has little buttons. Okay. Because I don't want to kill the does because I want them to keep reproducing. So anyway, 15 minutes. It's like going to the grocery store. I walked back in the woods, climbed up in a tree stand, climbed down, took the deer home. In 15 minutes, bow hunting, I'm done. People say, oh, you love to hunt. I, don't, I hunt 15 minutes. They, they think, oh, you're a big hunter. You love to hunt. And all. I hunted 15 minutes. Yeah, yeah, I hunted. Every year. Not in 15 minutes, but every year. Now, here's the interest. Kirsten, my youngest, is learning how to hunt by faith. Now, my, all my boys hunt by faith, and they've always dragged their deer in it just like I do. But she sowed her seed for an eight-point buck, and she missed it. Now, if you're a farmer and you miss the harvest, what do you do? What? You sow again. But she's learning that. She didn't sow again. So she and I went out, and I'm in a tree stand, and it's gun season, but she doesn't want to use a gun. They're too loud, she says. So she's using her crossbow, and she's about 50 yards from me. We're on the same trail, okay, the same trail. And so here comes this button buck. Now remember, I sewed for a seven-pointer bigger and a button buck. Here comes the button buck. And the button buck did something really crazy. Now remember, Kirsten has a bow. And it, here's Kirsten. Here I am. It comes towards Kirsten, and then it goes around her, just outside bow range. Comes back to the trail and comes and stands under my tree. And just stood there. And this first time I've done this, I just... I know, Kirsten said it was cute. It was a, I just decided to let it go. <laughs> but Kirsten was totally amazed how that deer walked around her stand because it wasn't her deer and came in. In fact, we could, he wouldn't go. He just stayed down there until we got out of the tree stand to go back in the house. He was still down there, and finally he just walked off. So you should be asking questions right now. How did the, how did the fish show up in Peter, James, and John's boats? How did the deer show up like that? How, why did the deer walk around Kirsten when she hadn't sown her seed for that deer and it on purpose went around her and came and stood under my tree as I had sown my seed for that? Questions should be going off, correct? The kingdom. You say, oh, Pastor, what does the kingdom mean? Laws? For instance, an airplane. Now, if you knew nothing about airplanes and here is a 20-ton piece of metal, and I say, you know, this, this is going to fly in the air at about, seven, uh, say, 560 miles an hour at about 40,000 feet, you'd laugh. you go, no, I wasn't born yesterday, dude. That weighs a lot. That thing cannot go in the sky. That is nuts. You're an, you're, 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 you no, know, it's just, forget it. I, not, not impossible. You'd walk off, Right? If you never knew what an airplane was. Because at 40,000 feet, you know what your future would be without a parachute or without an airplane. You know. You're not going to do that. But basically, the kingdom is a set of laws. So now, we don't cancel gravity. An airplane doesn't cancel gravity. It supersedes it. You've learned of a new law that allows you to travel a lot faster. As you take advantage of that law, your life has changed. Instead of walking to California, I don't know how long that would take, but you can be there in three or four hours by jet. Totally transform your life. That's exactly how the kingdom of God operates. The earth curse system, the laws of the earth realm are limited, but the kingdom of God, its laws supersede the earth realm. And the sooner you begin to learn why that deer did that and why this happened and why those fish showed up and how Jesus tapped into the laws of the kingdom, your life will change as well. And you're going to have to walk in the kingdom in 2018 to tap into what God wants to bring to you. Let me say that right now. The answer is Luke chapter 6, verse 20. Blessed are the poor, for God feels sorry for them. And Christian give, Christians give them their leftovers and their broken stuff. <laughs> they just quick. You reap what you sow, Christians. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God, a new set of laws. You can fly instead of walk. A different way of living. Ephesians 2:19, I read this last week. You are no longer foreigners and aliens, you are fellow citizens with God's people and members of his household. You are citizens. You have legal rights. 
There are benefits in the kingdom. There are benefits being part of God's household, sons and daughters. There are 7,000 promises in the Bible, 7,000 that God, the God that made everything you see and made you have given, has given to you personally that he's going to back up. 7,000 in the kingdom. But let's review for a minute. Adam and Eve were created. They had it all. They had the garden. They had no worry. They had no stress. They had no sickness and disease, but they gave it away because of a lie and deception. They rebelled against God, lost their position. God speaks to them after they rebelled. Genesis chapter 3, again, this is review, but this is very important as we're setting our posture for the new year, and you've got to pass the test. Adam said, or God said to Adam, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Now, Adam rebelled against God and came under the jurisdiction of Satan. Remember, the Bible says that Satan became the god of this world. And so he brought all mankind under that jurisdiction. So basically, Adam cursed the earth realm, not God. He had legal jurisdiction over it. He's the one that brought it under Satan's jurisdiction. He is the one that cursed it. God did not. You got it? God did not curse it. Now he says, through painful toil, you'll eat of the earth all the days of your life. It'll produce thorns and thistles for you, and you'll eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you'll eat your food until you return to the ground. So the painful toil and sweat system is how you grew up, painful toil and sweat. If you need something, you immediately begin to compute how to labor for it, more painful toil and sweat. But Jesus said, the unbeliever, those who don't know God's kingdom system, run after the things of life. Painfully toil and sweat after the things of life. So that's how we think without knowing that an airplane can fly, we'll think, how fast can I walk? You're getting this? If I don't know that there's an airplane, the only thing is I can grip my teeth and I can walk faster. It's not going to get there, friend. You will never reach your potential in your own strength. You were created by God to be with God, filled with his spirit, with supernatural strategies in the earth realm. So you've got to learn the kingdom way of living to reach your potential and what you dream to do. You'll never reach your dreams by yourself. It not happen. Not happen. When Adam lost his provision, he lost the Garden of Eden. He lost it all and he became a survivalist. He became a professional nose to the grindstone, painful toil and sweat survivalist. He lost his identity as well. His identity now was tied to what he did, not who he was. This is very, very important. If you saw Adam before he fell, you would see the glory of God on him, and he would carry an anointing and an authority of the kingdom of God himself. Now, he rebelled against God, but he is still created in God's image. You are still created in God's image, and you bear the seed of royalty. Adam lost the position, but you were still created for royalty to rule right right so he lost his identity in fact if we ask people who they are they answer with what they do if i meet someone and say hey how are you you know who are you i'm the carpenter i'm a computer specialist i'm a am i right <clears throat> why is that because in the earth realm respect and honor is judged by labor and who can win the rat race. <clears throat> but you don't say I'm the son of. If you were the king's son, a prince, or the king's daughter, a princess, how would you answer that? I am princess so-and-so. I am prince so-and-so. You would not answer with what you do because you have servants that do the doing. You're in the business of ruling. Are you with me? As long as you think as a slave and as someone who is judged by doing and you only think about doing, you will miss receiving from Father's house. Because you will judge yourself unworthy if you have not done enough to justify your vision of what is required to receive. In the prodigal son story, the prodigal son says, I know what I'll do. I'll go back to my father's house. All the servants there have more than enough. I am not worthy to be his son. I'll go back as a servant. And that's how the earth curse system has trained you as a servant. When you get up in the morning, you judge yourself. Do I look good enough? Did I do good enough? Am I, did I pray long enough? Did I do this well enough? 
Okay, I checked all the boxes. Oh, I feel pretty good about myself. I guess God will listen to me today. You've missed the entire point. Entire. The enemy is the accuser of the brother, and he will box you in a corner of condemnation over and over and over again that you can never get out of until you know who you are and what Jesus did for you. You tell him to shut up. I am the prince. I'm, actually, I'm the son of God. I, you know, God has called me righteous. You got something about that, you go talk to him about it. <laughs> got to think different. Can't dream up new places and new things with your nose to the grindstone being already overwhelmed. You got to think different. Who are you? You can't be a slave to provision. You can't be a slave in the earth curse system. You got to start asking questions. How did the fish show up? How did those deer show up? How did this happen? How did Jesus feed those multitudes? How did this, you know, he didn't tap into the labor system, the provision system, the earth curse to get those miracles done. He heard from God. The fish are there in the deep water. He talked about that. All right, so illustration I use in my conferences is that if I was walking down your street, and you've heard this many times before probably, but if you haven't, this is an interesting analogy. And I'm walking down your street. There's a brown paper bag in the ditch on the other side of the road of your property, and I pick it up. There's $5 million in it. You're the only person I know on the street, so I borrow your phone. You're a member of the church. Hey, so-and-so, I found this $5 million, and I use your phone. I'm going to call the sheriff. I call the sheriff. They say no one's, no one's claimed it missing. You can keep it. Now, that wouldn't happen that way, but for illustrative purposes, let's just say it could. I'm really happy. How about you? I'm in your house and your kitchen on the phone. How are you feeling about it? Don't lie to me about this. <laughs> You're not feeling good about it at all because it makes you feel bad about yourself. Right? Right? Makes you feel bad about yourself, like you're a loser, like you're not measuring up, you don't have the $5 million. And then the only option then is to become indignant and jealous because you found it close to my house. How dare you? It's not, that's not fair. Because you've been trained to equate what should happen based on labor. If I came in here and I was exhausted and I said, Drenda and I worked 18 hours a day for the last five years. We finally paid our house off last night. You'd all clap. It's oh, that's awesome. You know why? Because someone beat the system. And you think, well, if we just work hard enough, they did it, we can do it. That is not how the kingdom operates. You have learned that in the earth curse system, and you don't even realize, I don't even realize how we have been trapped in our thinking to these ways of thinking. We have been trained that way. And you're going to have to retrain yourself to capture the opportunities God has for you. You're not a hireling. You're not a hireling. You're a son and daughter of God, the God that made all things. Who are you? Acts, the second chapter, verse 32. God raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it, exalted to the right hand of God. He has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. This is the day of Pentecost. For David did not ascend to heaven, but yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6 says, And God has raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Where are we seated at? Where? You're not standing. You're seated. You're ruling. You're seated on the right hand of the Father. You are royalty. You, you get this. You got to know who you are in the kingdom. The Bible says, whatever you bind on earth shall be loose, uh, bound by heaven, and what you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. You carry the kingdom's authority. You're seated on the right hand of the Father. But in the earth realm, everyone's tired of running. Everyone has been raised with an orphan mentality. So we got to talk about that. There is an escape, though, from this running and sweating mentality. It's Proverbs chapter 10, verse 22. The blessing of the Lord brings wealth, and he adds no sorrow with it. The Hebrew word for sorrow means hard labor. This is, of course, referring back to Genesis chapter 3. 
The blessing of the Lord brings wealth. What is the blessing? We talked about this in our latest series called The Grain Pile Principle. I would get that and review that. But basically, the blessing of the Lord are the promises God has given you. Think about this. If the God that made everything you see and made yourself and invented life gave you 7,000 promises directly to you and he cannot lie, I think you would call that a blessing. The blessing of the Lord. Matthew chapter 11, 28, come to me all you who are weary and burdened and I'll give you rest. Now this is the rest we're talking about in this series. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for my gentle and I'm humble in heart and you'll find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know, of course, two oxen and a yoke. He says, take my yoke upon you. Jesus is gonna pull it, come in behind him. He can handle it. It's easy. All right. Got to learn how this works. I was doing a little dinner for about 25 pastors, uh, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago. I'm not sure how far along ago it was. And I was talking along the lines of these principles because, listen, after being in our financial situation nine years and you get out and you see like a light bulb, things begin to change and you begin to step into things you've only dreamt about, you're pretty excited. As I said last week, that's why this church is here. I want you to be pretty excited about your life. So I was talking, we concluded the meeting and all the pastors left and then we were cleaning the room up. One had been sitting in the car waiting to come back in because it was, a, you know, they knew, all, they knew each other and he didn't want to speak in front of all these friends. So he came in after the meeting. His wife and he came up with a $100 check. He said, this is the end of our money. We want to sow this. We lose our house on Friday. We need $7,700 to bring it current. We have no checks. We have no income before that date. We have no hope. We're going to sow this, believe, believe in God for, uh, you know, a way of escape. So we prayed with them. Now, in their garage, they had a silk screen machine. They would do some T-shirts every once in a while for youth groups or some small projects. But that Monday, this meeting was on Saturday night. That Monday, they received three calls for business for silk screening. They had to hustle to get it done, but they did $8,700 in five days, and they brought their house current. He's pretty excited about that. Right now, you should be thinking and asking questions, how did that happen? That was the largest week he ever had, ever, and they called him. How did that happen? I was in another pastor's meeting down south. I think it was Charlotte. I, I, we, I don't remember that meeting was. It was in uh, South Carolina, I think, or North, North Carolina. Anyway, it was down south. 250 pastors. I was in the room, and this pastor comes over very excitedly. I need to shake your hand. I mean, he was, I got to shake your hand. Well, that's fine. Okay, yeah. He says, I got to tell you my story. And he lives in Germany. He said, my son came into the study one weekend as I was, one week as I was preparing for that weekend's message, and he came up to me and said, I want you to agree with me for a PlayStation 2. He said, what? He said, well, I got these CDs by Gary Cassie. I don't know how he, he's only like 10, 12 years old. I mean, maybe 12. How, I don't know how he got my CDs in Germany. I don't know. But he had them, and his dad didn't know he had them. <laughs> maybe a friend, I don't know. He's listening to these CDs and he says, you know, I, I, I'd like to have a PlayStation 2, Dad, and I want to sew for that and I want to call it done according to Mark eleven twenty four. I want to believe God for a PlayStation 2. His dad said, all right, I'll agree with you. So they prayed and they agreed and the next day a guy called the dad and said, is your son available? I need, I need some work done today. And he did the work and he got the money that day and he paid cash for his PlayStation 2. Now that kind of changed his mindset right? Just like Peter, James, and John, they were so astonished. They left everything. They saw a different system operate. He saw a system operate. So two weeks later, he comes back to his dad and says, I want you to agree with me for one more thing. What's that? I want you to agree with me for muscles. <laughs> his dad said, well, wait a minute, you know, that's going to take, uh, you're, you're going to be involved with that. I said, I know, dad, I know. I just want to, I'm going to believe God for muscles. He said, all right. They agreed. They prayed. The next morning, a station wagon pulls into the driveway. He recognizes it's a member of their church, 
comes to the front door and says, hey, we are cleaning the garage out, and I just thought maybe your son might want this set of barbells that I haven't used for all these years that were just sitting in my garage. I brought them by, just thought maybe he might like them. Now, this pastor here in uh, South Carolina looked at me and says, that's when I told my son, give me those CDs. <laughs> yeah. I got this letter from a partner from Keith. He's probably watching right now, Keith. Great story. Keith's been a partner for a number of years here. I'll read it. Once again, I find myself crying as I attempt to write this message to you. Six years ago, when Keith and I first saw you on Sid Roth and ordered those first CDs, we could not possibly have imagined the journey we were about to take. It has been a wild ride. We knew that your message was a true revelation to you from God and that we needed to immerse ourselves in your teaching to wash away all the religion and lies about God we've been taught. Today, we joined your service online and cried through most of it as we rejoiced in what God has done through and for us. A short version of our story is that two weeks after we moved into our new home, Keith lost his job. This would have destroyed him and caused him much fear if he had not been well-versed in your teachings. For that, we greatly thank you. It was a blessing in disguise. He started a trucking company with, that part, with part of his retirement fund. A few months after he started, a friend called him and asked him to come and talk about doing some hauling for a, another company that he had worked for. Keith didn't go for several months because he thought that he was too busy. However, this friend was persistent, and Keith finally went to meet with him. And during the meeting, this friend slid a check across the desk showing Keith how much his company was paying a different trucking company for a single week of work. It was $50,000. This blew Keith's mind, but it gave him something to believe in. As you have taught us, and you can see it, you can have it. He came home with a new vision for his business. So we started the new, the new what do you call it, the regrouping or the, the relaunch of our business, if you will, in December of 2016. That's a year ago. And the first week, we made $8,718, exclamation mark. That's pretty good money, right? We thought we'd really made it big, but God was not done. Keith had struggled with tithing all of his life. It wasn't that he was a, uh, not a giving kind of person. He simply did not see how the math would work if he tithed. I told him that it was a supernatural event, and I prayed that God would blow his mind when he started to tithe consistently. Well, he really did. Last week, less than a year later, and this is in December, this December, uh, we sent this company invoice for our trucking, our trucking company for $31,775.84 for one week of work. We stand and release our faith with you every week. We give all the glory to God. We thank him every day for you and your ministry. We know that we would still be on that hamster wheel of work and toil if it were not for you and your ministry, I just had to tell you this good news. By the way, we expect another record-breaking week this week. Keith, good job. Think bigger, Keith. Keep going. And I would, I would say this to Keith. Keith, now start thinking national, you know. You got the prototype, now duplicate it. All right. Here's another email I received this week. Excuse my English, she says. Last year on the same date, I was buying Christmas presents with credit cards, taking the cards to the limit because I didn't have any money to buy presents for my daughter who still believed in Santa Claus. I lived in constant anxiety and sadness, and I wrote to Pastor Gary on this website that this sewing thing just doesn't work. Nothing's happened. And he very patiently answered me and said, wait, the harvest doesn't always come the very next day. Today, December 20th, 2017, I'm buying presents for my, all my family with cash. I'm buying presents that cost three and four hundred dollars a piece. I'm honoring people who helped me, helped me in those difficult times. Last year, I lived in a room in a basement that some friends allowed me to stay there for a few months. I didn't even have enough money to buy food or gasoline. I now live in a beautiful and fancy apartment, and my refrigerator is full of food. December 3rd was my daughter's birthday. We took her to Hershey Park in Pennsylvania. We invited her best friend. We stayed at the Hershey Hotel. We paid cash for everything, and she got gifts that cost hundreds of dollars. Um, last year, I was humiliated when someone gave me $30 to celebrate my daughter's birthday. 
I cannot even write this post without weeping. I am so grateful to Pastor Gary and his wife. This year has been the best year of my life. The things God has done in my life are wonderful. I could write a book with all my stories. Thank you, Pastor Gary, for teaching me that I can live heaven on earth. I like that. All right. And so can you. So can you. But as I'm even saying these words, a lot of you, those thoughts are canceling what I'm saying. Uh, not for me. I don't know. I, I'm just, I don't know about that. I don't know. I've tried so hard. I don't know. Yeah, you've tried hard. They fished all night and caught nothing. We're not saying you didn't try hard. We're just saying there's another law. There's another system. You need to learn how it operates, right? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9 and 10 Let me read that. We're going to close service here in just a second. Let me read this to you. Hebrews chapter 4. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. That's the New Testament. There remains a Sabbath rest for you. Now, what could they not do on the Sabbath? They couldn't sweat toil. They couldn't couldn't work. So if you can't work on the Sabbath... How do you exist on the Sabbath if you can't work? We've got to find that out. The Bible says there is a Sabbath rest for you. Verse 10, for anyone who enters God's rest, now this is important, anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work just as God did from his. Now we go back to Genesis to find out what they're saying. Let me read it again. For anyone who enters God's rest, now in, in uh, six days he made the, the earth, right? The seventh day, it says he rested. He was not tired. The Bible says that he was, it was complete and he was finished. That's why he rested. Are you getting this? So when the Bible says anyone who enters into God's rest also rests from his own work. Why? Because he already has everything that's complete. Just as God rested from his. Why did God rest? Help me out. Why did God rest? He was finished. Not tired. He was finished, and everything was there for man to live on the earth realm. Man was created at the end of the sixth day to live in the seventh day. Everything was there. Everything was there. Everything was there. There was no stress. When we enter into God's rest, everything's complete. We rest. Does that make sense? I mean, if if your, your bills are paid and you got groceries... You're not stressed, right? That's basically what it's saying, is that when everything's complete and in the kingdom, everything is complete, everything has been made new, and you have access to the kingdom, you'll find rest if you enter into God's rest, everything's complete. 